Thank you, Bjorn, for the introduction. And thank, thanks very much to everyone for being here and to the organizers for inviting me here. So it's a pleasure to finally be able to speak in front of an audience. Um, I, I'm not used to, to this anymore, so please help me by asking many questions, as you did for... Sorry? I wonder if it's possible to bend it a little To closer. bend it? Ah. Is it better like this? Yeah, it's good? OK. Thank you. So as, as I was saying, I'm not used to giving uh, talks in, in front of audiences anymore. So please help me by asking as many questions as you like, as you did with uh, uh, other lectures. Um, also, the, so the notes, uh, uh, at least for the first two talks, are written and available on the PCMI web page. Also, the exercises. So I encourage you to go to the exercise session uh, led by Diego, who is there. Um, and so, OK. I will be talking about the inverse Galois problem, so let me start by introducing this. And also, let me know if I write too small or anything. <coughs> so, my story starts with Galois theory, so uh, uh, 200 years ago. So, Galois explained how when you start with an irreducible polynomial, f of t, with coefficients in q, if it's irreducible, Galois explain how you can associate with it a finite group. Uh, so uh, that was in uh, 1830. Uh, and uh, perhaps we forget how much of a revolution it was at the time. People knew how to solve equations of degree 2, 3, 4. They were looking for solutions in degree 5 by doing uh, computations and trying concrete things. And then Galois came up with this uh, very general theory, um, which completely changed the landscape. So in fact, it's not even obvious how to associate with uh, a polynomial its group of symmetries. So today, we understand this very well. We look at Q bar. We look at the subfield generated by all of the roots of f, and we, took, we take the automorphism group of this field. But uh, at the time, it was really not something obvious, and it took many years even for uh, other mathematicians to understand, um, uh, to understand this association in Galois theory. <coughs> and even just this is, is full of, of computational challenges. So if you uh, feed the polynomial into a computer, it can, in, in theory, give you the, the Galois group back, but in practice it will do this only if the, if the polynomial is, is small enough. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Okay, so uh, 200 years later, uh, we understand things better, but not so much. Uh, vexing problem, we still don't know the answer to the question, what finite groups do you get in this way? Um, so more precisely, uh, do all finite groups appear in this way? That's the question. Appear, sorry, in this way. So that's the inverse Galois problem. So can you reverse this arrow? Um, so let me point out that it's a fundamentally number theoretic problem. Uh, you can ask the same question starting from uh, other fields than Q. Um, but then the, the, the answer, so, well, it depends very much on the field. If you start with an algebraically closed field, of course it's no. With uh, the reals, it's no. With QP, it's not so obvious, but it's no, because you only get sol solvable groups, uh, and so on and so forth. So if the answer to this question over Q is yes, it's really because of the precise nature of Q. It's, it's, an, it's number theory. Um, so, okay. so uh, the hope is that the answer is yes. But it's very much open. Uh, so there's a very long list of positive results let me mention just a few. Uh, so some positive answers. <coughs> so 
well, the first groups, I guess, were the symmetric groups and the alternating group. So this was due to Hilbert. Um, uh, an important theorem is uh, Shafarevich's theorem that uh, you can do it for solvable groups. So the case of a billion groups is an exercise. I mean, it's, it's in the list of exercises you, that you, you will do. Solvable groups, Shafarevich. So then if you can do solvable groups, it's, it's natural to look at simple groups. So there's a, a classification. So there are some infinite families, and there are the 26 sporadic sim simple nonabelian groups. So among them, uh, all of them have been realized except one. So all uh, sp uh, sporadic groups except M23. Uh, so here there's a long list of names. I'm not going to write them all. I mean, they're, they're in the notes. Um, so, but for example, the monster group was realized by Thompson. Um, and, okay, some, some various, sorry, uh, various infinite families of simple groups. So there are so many results, I'm just going to state one of simple groups. So for example, PSL2 of FP So for all primes p, this is known to be uh, a Galois group over q. So in this generality, this is due to z winner. There were many uh, uh, partial results before. OK, but uh, even for such a simple group as PSL2 of q, where q is just a, a part of a prime and not a prime, the, the, the problem is open. So it's, it's very open in general. Open, so even for PSL2 of F27. So that's just one example. So um, in this course, what we're going to do is uh, to uh, discuss some of the methods that have been at, uh, used to, to attack this problem. So again, there are many results, also many methods. I'm not going to be able to talk about uh, all of them, or even a, a significant proportion of them, but I've tried to uh, select the most most important topics. And also, I I should say that, uh, as as is often the case in, in mathematics, um, the proofs are sometimes more interesting than the than the results. I mean, this is a fundamental problem, but I mean, there's no use, there's no direct use application for this. Uh, but um, but many of the methods involve lots of uh, questions or objects that are interesting for their own sake and that have been studied and lead, I mean, independently of the inverse Galois problem. So that's the actual goal of the of the uh, of the course to to, dis to discuss these topics connected to this, but which lead to other uh, other directions as well. Okay, so um, <coughs> this particular problem. Uh, has no direct application, but there are lots of variants, some of which do have applications. So let me mention one example of a variant. Uh, so it's the so-called Grunwald's problem. Um, so from now on, I will not look just at Q, but at any number of field. It makes no difference for everything I will discuss, but y you can stick to Q if you like. So let G be a finite group. And K, a number of field. Uh, so some, some notation I will denote by omega the set of places. So if you're looking at Q, this would be the prime numbers and the infinite place. 
And as in Bianca's talk, I will denote by kv the completion uh, of k at a place v. So uh, what the Grun what Grunwald uh, what the Grunwald pr uh, sorry what the Grunwald problem is about is uh, in this situation can you not only realize g as a Galois group over k uh, but can you also uh, realize it by an extension whose completion at a finite set of places is prescribed? So let's introduce a finite set of places S. <coughs> and for any place in S, let's fix some Galois extension of the completion. So capital KV over KV. So Galois, uh, a Galois extension. Uh, so if you start with a Galois extension of K with group G, if you complete it, uh, you don't get in general a Galois extension with group G, but only with group a subgroup of G. So here, I'm going to assume that the, the, the Galois group is a subgroup of G. So, uh, OK, and let me say this in a very weak way, that the Galois group can be embedded into G. OK. And then the question is, is there a Galois extension of uh, K? Uh, capital K over K with Galois group G. And uh, whose completion uh, at a place above V is capital KV. For all, sorry, so this is for V in S. I fix this for, uh, for V in S. Fix capital KV, and then, OK. Uh, and for any V in S, the completion at V is KV. OK, is the question clear? Yeah. Yes? Uh, I'm sorry, you ask if it's a place in capital K or small k. Yeah, so I mean here really is a place of small k, but here what I mean is you take um, a place of capital K above V, you complete there, and then you should recover this thing, which I denoted capital K sub V. And I mean, this does not depend on the place you choose because it's Galois. OK. Any other question? So yeah. you want uh, the Galois group of local extensions to be specific subgroups inside the group of extensions. OK. No, OK. I mean, you can give a more precise statement, and this will come later. But for now, I'm just. Uh, it's just in a loose sense, uh, isomorphic to it. But yeah, I mean, you can be more precise, of course. OK, any other question? OK, so I mean, this, okay, this is the Grunwald problem. It has an interesting history. It started with a paper of Grunwald, who in fact proved the, that the answer is yes if the group is a billion. And this was used by many other people. Uh, and in, it was even given a, another proof by someone else, and 15 years later, a counterexample was found. So <laughs> uh, this happens. Fortunately, the, the applications uh, were saved. Um. So the counterexample was given by Wang. And so the answer is no. So even for uh, k equals q, uh, for s you take just the prime 2. And, and the uh, extension of q2 that you, con the, that you consider, sorry, the g, uh, uh, g is z mod, uh, z mod 8z, very simple. 
And the extension you consider at 2 of Q2 is the unique unramified extension of degree 8. Uh, unramified of degree 8. So Wang proved that if you start with the cyclic extension of Q of degree 8, you can never, by completing it at 2, get this one. Uh, okay, I'm not explaining the proof. It's part of the exercises, uh, you, so you, you will see it. Um, so the answer is no, but uh, Wang was able to fix the mistake, and so this gave the so-called Grunewald Wang, Wang theorem, which gives a complete answer for abelian groups. So a complete answer uh, for abelian G. So I'm not stating the theorem because it's a bit technical, but uh, in summary, the answer is almost always yes. You only have this this problem with respect to the prime two. Um, uh, ah. And in general, so uh, if you take any finite group G, <coughs> uh, the expectation is that the answer should be yes for any finite group G as long as the set of places S avoids a certain set of exceptional places. So hope uh, for any G, uh, yes if S does not contain any place which, which lies above one of the primes dividing the order of G. If S contains no place, so let me say dividing the order of G. So at least no counterexample to this is known. Okay. So uh, this is one uh, useful variant. There are other variants. Um, so for example, embedding problems and yet other variants that you will see in the exercises. Um, but let me not discuss them now. So yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really sorry, I didn't understand the question. Um, so <laughs> Is it okay? Yeah. Okay, for every finite abelian group, we can already realize it as a Galois extension over Q. That's yes. That's easy and it's just use Frank Weber term. And yes. So why I didn't understand when you say it's complete answer for for ah. abelian G. I think you just meant for this completion method, right? K yeah, yeah, yeah. complete that's answer to Grunewald's problem. Okay, that's yes. it. because it's kind of confusing. It's sorry, like sorry, sorry. Thank you for the uh, for the question. So first, I discussed the inverse Galois problem. So indeed, for abelian groups, the answer is always yes, and in fact, even for solvable groups. And here, here's a variant Grunewald's problem. It's more restrictive. And so there's a complete answer to this, to Grunewald's problem. Thank you. Uh, for a billion G, yeah. So it's really this. You, you fix places, comp uh, extensions of the uh, completions, and you, you look for, for, a, for this uh, capital K here. Yeah, so the answer, you cannot, you cannot always do it uh, even over Q. But at least this theorem tells you exactly when you can do it and when you cannot, for any number field and any abelian group, and any, um, I mean any given set of places and, and, and completions and, and extensions of the completions. Okay, thank you. So um, 
Today, I'm going to talk about the first approach that was suggested for attacking the inverse Galois problem. Um, ah, well, uh, okay, that was just the hope. Sorry, so let me repeat it. The hope is that Grunewald's problem has a positive answer for any finite group G as long as you avoid F S these exceptional places. So, um, to discuss this first approach, with, which was due to Hilbert and Nutter, let me uh, let me talk about uh, torsos. So torsos and their fibers. So I'm going to employ a, a geometric language because it's it's uh, uh, really useful to understand the situation. Um, so let me define what a torsor is. So, um, so fix a finite group G. And K a field. So a G torsor. It's going to be a, a morphism of varieties, algebraic varieties defined over K. So let me add some words. Uh, finite, oops. Finite et al. morphism So let me call it pi from y to x So here y and x are varieties over k um, So I mean variety in a very uh, loose sense I mean it's something defined by algebraic equations I'm not assuming that my varieties are connected for example So let me write it uh, here. So x, y are varieties over k. Possibly disconnected. Um, so finite is going to imply that the fibers are finite. Uh, so y and x have the same dimension. And et al, well, uh, it means there's no ramification. So if, if you're working in, in, uh, in, if k is a subfield of C, the complex numbers, you look at the complex points, it means it's a local isomorphism. Anyway, if you, if you don't know what this is, you just ignore it. In characteristic zero, it's going to be a consequence of what I write next. So um, an et al morphism with an action of g on y. of g on y such that well first the morphism is equivariant so uh, it's invariant under g pi is uh, g equivariant and if you look at the fibers of the of this morphism uh, when you look at the, say, the, the k-bar points, k-bar is an algebraic closure of k, the action of g on the fiber is simply transitive. So the action of g on the fibers so of the map between k-bar points induced by pi Uh, is simply transitive. <coughs> so, um, oops. Another way to formulate this is to say that first of all, G should act freely on on Y. Well, of course, because it acts on the fibers and it acts freely on the fibers. And it induces an isomorphism between the quotient of y by g and x. And pi in, uh, induces 
an isomorphism uh, from this quotient, y quotiented by g, to x. OK, <coughs> so it looks like a rather abstract definition, but we will see examples, and I mean you will understand the motivation for introducing them. So he, here's a trivial example. A uh, trivial action. Thank you. So here I really just mean that uh, if you compose, if you precompose by an element of G, you get the same morphism. Thank you. <coughs> uh, okay, so here's a trivial example. So that's the trivial torso. Uh, it's just a disjoint union of copies of X, as many copies as there are of elements of G. So X cross G. Uh, with the projection, I mean, this is not very interesting, but it's it's a, it's a JIT also. Okay, so why are we interested in this? So here's a remark. So we're interested in Galois extensions of K with Galois group G. Uh, so g and the thing is, Galois, so field extensions, uh, capital K over small k of, uh, with Galois group G, well, in fact, that's the same thing as a connected G torsor over the point. connected uh, G torsor over the point. So the point is the variety consisting of just one point. If you like, it's spec K over the point. Uh, spec K. And because of this, we're really translating our question into a question about torsors. So here connected means really uh, the variety Y, the variety is connected. It's not the disjoint union of uh, non-trivial disjoint union of varieties, for example, as would be the case here, where it's a disjoint union of copies of X. So why is this? Well, let's think about what's the right-hand side. What is a connected G torsor over the point? Well, um, so you have some Y to X. X is the point. This is a finite morphism, so Y is going to be an affine variety. So it's uh, spec B. Uh, and so B is a K-algebra. It's reduced because um, the morphism is etal. It's finite dimensional as a vector space over K because it's a finite morphism. And I'm assuming it's connected. So it's not a, a, a product of algebras in a non-trivial way. Well, these three things imply that B is a field. It's an integral domain. It's a, it's a field. I mean, that's an elementary fact about uh, in, in commutative algebra. So B is a field. OK, so that's one thing. but. Why is it a Galois extension with group G? Well, that's because of this characterization here. So if Y is affine with ring of functions B, then the quotient is affine with ring of functions, uh, the invariance of, of, of G on B. So Y over G, that's spec BG. So we are assuming that BG is a uh, small k. And that, of course, tells us that B, because it's a field, it's a Galois extension of k with group G. OK? So, OK. This is the explanation of, of that.
Okay, and then you can look at G torsos over the point which may not be connected, and what are they? Well, then you have, a, you have several connected components, and each of them uh, is going to be uh, um, a field extension of K, uh, which is Galois with group a subgroup of G, by the same type of considerations. So more generally, uh, a G, uh, so you have a, a correspondence between G torsos uh, over, so I will, I will just say over K instead of over spec K. So G torsos over K, that's the same thing as Galois extensions with group a subgroup of G. Galois extensions of K with Galois group a subgroup of G. Okay, and because I had a, a question about uh, subgroups, fixing subgroups and so on, so to be perfectly precise here, to have a, absolutely an equivalence here, I should say G torsos with a choice of a connected component. Okay, but this is not going to be important for us. I mean, otherwise it's just a conjugacy class of subgroups. Right, so what's the point of this? Well, the point is the following observation, which is due to Hilbert. So now we're looking for this, for a connected G torsor of other points. Hilbert observed that you can start Uh, with a G torsor over some variety given a G torsor Y to X. If you want to solve the inverse Galois problem now, all you need to do is to find the rational point of X whose fiber is connected. Because if you take the fiber of a G torsor, it's still a G torsor. Given a G torsor okay, over K, to solve the inverse Galois problem, it suffices to find a rational point of x such that the fiber is connected. So let me call it pi here. So pi inverse of x is connected. And why is it, is it interesting? It's because it's, it's in fact easy to exhibit G torsos like this, where x and y are very, uh, very nice varieties, uh, as connected as you want. And then it becomes a problem of a slightly different nature. You're looking for rational points on the base. And what Hilbert uh, proved is that uh, you can find such uh, fibers in, in many situations uh, So this is Hilbert's irreducibility theorem. So assume that X is a, uh, an open in P1. Over K. K is a number field. And you fix a G torsor uh, from Y to X. A G torsor, G is any finite group. Uh, a G torsor. You assume that the, the total space Y is connected, otherwise you're not going to find such fibers. So Hilbert says, then X contains rational points whose fibers are connected. Uh, X 
of k such that the fiber is connected. So usually this is stated in, in terms of a two variable polynomial which is reducible. You, s you, s you can specialize one of the variables such that the polynomial is still reducible. This is the translation of this statement. Um, so <laughs> there's a useful refinement of this which was proved, I think, by Ikedal. It's that in addition, you can choose x to be as close as you want to local points of, uh, of P1 at any finite set of places. In addition, you can choose x close to xv, uh, any, any xv you like, at any finite set of places. V in S, any finite S. Um, sorry, I keep uh, losing the eraser. A corollary of this is that, in fact, the, the same statements are still true if you replace P1 by Pn. That's actually in the exercises. Uh, excuse me? Yeah. Uh, I'm over here. Uh, I just want to ask, I'm a bit confused on that uh, second ball from the right. What happens if you, the point that you take is also rational for a subfield of K? Do you still get the Galois extension with the right group or just with a subgroup? I, sorry, if it's also uh, a rational point of a sub-extension of, of K, you say? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm not exactly sure what you mean. I mean, it could happen that if you go to a, 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 um, an overfield of K, the fiber is not connected anymore. Uh, but then if you apply the theorem over the overfield, it's not going to give you this point, but another one. Um, so I'm just not Yes, it could happen to be defined over a subfield, but that doesn't matter. OK, OK, maybe that's just my uh, algebraic geometry, which is a bit too confused. I mean, what the theorem is telling you is that uh, you can find some point which maybe is defined over a smaller subfield, but at least viewed as a k point, uh, it gives you a, fi a, fine, a, a Galois extension of k uh, with group G. Okay, so corollary, the same, same, same statements are true if you can replace P1 by Pn. The same holds. With Pn for any n. Okay, so. This is interesting because now we are looking at a slightly different problem. So a corollary of all of this, um, if you want to solve the inverse Galois problem, it's enough to find a, a faithful action of G on some variety such that the quotient is an open subset of Pn. To solve the inverse Galois problem for G over K, enough to find Uh, a, a variety y and an action of g on y faithful such that the quotient is so I will not say an open subset of pn but I will say a, a rational variety such that the quotient is rational. So let me recall what rational means here. 
So a variety is said to be rational if it contains an open subset, which is also an open subset of projective space. So that means uh, IE contains, so it yeah, contains an open subset that is also an open in PM. Okay, and so why is that? Yes? Sorry, to, to be to be sorry, I f uh, to be close. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, y you 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 can fix a finite set of places, and at each of these places, you can fix a local point. Then you can choose. Uh, you can fix also a neighborhood in the viadic topology uh, of uh, this point in X of KV. Then you can choose X so such that it belongs to this neighborhood. Okay. So it's a weak approximation, as in Bianca's talk. You can do the. You can do weak approximation on, on PN, that's well known, and you can do Hilbert reducibility, but you can do the two at the same time. Okay, so why is this? Well, the thing is, if you take a variety like this and a faithful action of G, so maybe the action is not free, but it's going to be free on an open subset because the group is finite. So uh, you just have to remove some finitely many sub varieties to get a, a, a free action, so proof. G acts freely on uh, Y naught uh, and open, and then take the quotient, uh, it's a torso. It's a G torso, but now the, the, the base is an open of PN, so you can apply this theorem to it, and the top space. Uh, uh, okay, I, I want okay connected variety, a connected variety. So I assume it to be connected, and then then we can just apply. Okay, so this is really um, a different problem. So example, um, So this is not a big deal, but it, it illustrates the, the the corollary. If you take g equals z mod 3z, and you let it act on p1, by the uh, automorphism given in homogeneous coordinates by x, y maps to y, uh, x minus y, uh, you can check this is an automo uh, sorry y y minus x sorry y y minus x you can check this is of an automorphism of order three and it's faithful uh, so you apply the corollary and what's the quotient well the quotient is a curve which is dominated by p one it's a unirational curve curve of genus zero there's no other option it, and it has rational points because there are lots of rational points coming from p one. So the only such curve is P1. So by just abstract reasoning, you know this is P1. And so you can apply the corollary. And so in this way, you get cyclic extensions of degree 3 over any number of fields. Of course, it's not a big deal. You can do this directly. But it illustrates you can do it without thinking. OK, so this leads us to Nutter's problem. Uh, so that's uh, section three. So Nutter asked, uh, so she saw this, and she asked the following. So it's a question which makes sense over any field. K of field, G, a finite group.
Let's embed G in, into a symmetric group in some way. Then let's make the symmetry group act on affine space by just permuting the coordinates. By permuting the coordinates. This is the easiest example of a faithful action of G on a variety which is connected. So you can ask, does it satisfy the hypothesis of the corollary? In other words, is the quotient rational? In very concrete terms, this means, is the field of function of this variety purely transcendental? In other words, if you take the field of rational functions k of t1, tn, and you take those that are invariant under the action of G by permutation of the variables, is this purely transcendental over K? So of course, if the answer is yes, by the previous corollary, you get G as a Galois group over K. So the first example of such a, si such a situation was given by Hilbert himself. It's when you take for G the symmetric group. So example, Hilbert, take G the symmetric group. Then we're looking at rational functions, which are invariant under all permutations. So this is well known. Uh, such functions, our polynomials are sorry, our rational, uh, our rational functions in the elementary symmetric polynomials. So yes. So you get uh, the the the, the f function field, rational function field, in the elementary symmetric polynomials. And so that's it. We've already realized Sn as a Galois group over any number field without thinking. So, okay, this does not give you concrete equations. This is another topic. But at least we know that there exists uh, an extension of K with group Sn. Another example due to Fischer is uh, the answer to this question, Nato's problem, is yes, if the group is abelian, and k is the field of complex numbers. This is not so hard, it's part of the exercises. Another example, due to Maeda, The answer is yes, over any field. Uh, if the group is A5, the alternating group A5. So this is any, any K. Of course, here also it was any K. And I, I encourage you to look at Maeda's paper. It's, it's, it's really quite astonishing. I mean, the proof is completely explicit. He gives a, trans a transcendence basis uh, for this field uh, by, I mean, explicit polynomials, um, and he proves that it works. Um, surprisingly enough, the problem is completely open over any field for the other alternating groups. So open. Can, can I ask a question? In Fisher's statement is, how is G embedded in SN? Any embedding of G in, in any SN? Sorry, so here I mean in G equals SN? In, in Fisher's. Oh, in Fisher, Fisher yes, any embedding. Any embedding. Of, okay. Yes. Thank you for the question. Sorry, the, uh, yeah, the question was, uh, does it depend on the embedding of G in SN here? And no, it, you can take any embedding. 
Okay, so here uh, I was saying the Natos problem is, is open even over the complex numbers for any other alternate, uh, every uh, all other alternating groups, even A6. So that's a challenge. Maybe you can just find an explicit transcendental basis. Who knows? Yes, A3 and A4 are easy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, I mean the, yeah, the bigger. Uh, alternating groups. Okay, so for a long time people thought that the answer to Natos problem would be yes in general and that would be the, the way to attack uh, the inverse Galois problem. But in fact uh, it was not so. Uh, 50 years later negative answers were found. Uh, so I will, so next I will, uh, so my next goal will be to explain uh, in the simplest way, one negative answer. So this leads me to the notion of uh, versality. So uh, if you have a G tensor, uh, pi from y to x, so for any finite group G and if over any field K, we say that it is versal if you can get all G tensors over all field extensions of K just by looking at the fibers of pi. If for any field extension K prime over K, any G tensor over K prime comes from a fiber of pi over a k prime point of x. So the, the torsor knows about all torsors over fields, uh, field extensions of, of, of k. So the word versal comes from universal, but you remove uni because the, there's no unicity of this x. And, okay, an example is the torsor that is considered in Nutter's problem. So you, you embed G into SN and you let it act on affine space by permuting the coordinates. You look at the open space, the open set where it acts freely. So uh, let's call it Y, so that uh, it's the open where G acts freely. So the points whose coordinates are pairwise distinct. And then the, this torsor is versal. So Y goes to Y mod G. So this is not uh, completely obvious. It's a consequence of uh, Hilbert's theorem 90. Uh, well, it's part of, uh, of the exercises. but you can take it as a black box. Okay, and why is versality interesting for us? Uh, it's because of the following criterion. So proposition, K a number field, So suppose you have a versal torsor a versal G torsor y to x defined over k uh, such that so with y connected and x rational For example, this is the case if you have a positive answer to Nutter's problem. So what I claim is that then Grunwald's problem has a positive answer.
for G over K. Uh, sorry, for G over K and for any finite set of places. For G, K, any S. So why is it so? Let me just explain in, in 10 seconds. Uh, so sketch of proof. So recall, wh what are we trying to do? We, we have a finite set of places. We have fixed ga Galois extensions of the completions KV, whose Galois groups are subgroups of G. And we try to find a, a Galois extension of K whose completions are these ones. OK, so recall, locally, we have these Galois extensions. They give us torsos over KV, uh, torsos for a subgroup of G. But as I've explained, these are the same as G torsos, which may not be connected. So the local uh, given extensions give uh, possibly disconnected G torsos over the completions KV. But then by versality, these G torsos come from rational points of X over KV. They come, they, they are pi inverse of XV for some xv in x of kv. But now we are on a rational variety. So we, we know we can do weak approximation. We, we can approximate all of these xvs by a rational point x. And Hilbert's irreducibility theorem tells us we can find one rational point whose fiber is connected. And as I told you, Ikedal tells us we can do the two things at the same time. So by Ikedal. You can find x in x of k close to the xv's such that the fiber is connected. But then we, we're done. The fiber is connected, so it gives us a Galois extension of k with group G because it's a G torsor, it's a connected G torsor. And you just have to convince yourself that if you choose x, x close enough to xv, then when you complete at v, you will get the same torso. And OK, that's a, a variant of Krasner's lemma. Um, that if you move a little bit the uh, equations of the coefficients of the polynomial, it will not change the, the, the fields generated by the roots. Uh, OK, but that's a, just a sketch, so I, I, I don't enter into details here. And so, from this, we did use a positive answer to Grunewald's problem for any finite set S for the symmetry group uh, for A5. So we can do more than just uh, the inverse Galois problem here. We can interpolate local extensions. But more importantly, from this, we did use a negative answer to Nutter's problem for Z mod 8Z. Yeah, just so that you know, we'll need to stop pretty soon. I'm so sorry? We will need to stop pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I just write this and that's it. Uh, so uh, corollary of this, so you just apply it. Because we know Grunewald's problem has a negative answer for Z mod 8Z over Q. That's Wang's counter example. The contrapositive tells us that uh, we have a negative answer to Nutter's problem. So Q, so using Wang. So Q of T1, T8, if you take the field of invariance under Z mod 8Z acting cyclically on the, by permuting cyclically the, the variables, so this is not uh, purely transcendental. OK, and that's it for today. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for a quick question or two.
Uh, anybody have a question?